Hello everyone uh, and thank you for joining me for today's topic. Today we're going to be chatting about topic 13 which is additional requirement for high buildings. You've reached this video lecture through the link you found in the course notes posted for you. So before you proceed, please be sure to download the set of course notes posted for you to your device of choice because you never know when you'll lose access to these course notes. So make sure you have it on your device of choice. Again, today's topic is additional requirement for high buildings as outlined in subsection 3.2.6 of the Ontario Building Code. Let's get started. So for today's topic, we're going to look at whether or not there are additional requirements for so-called high buildings. But even more importantly, we're going to look at, according to the building code, part three of the building code, how high is high? And specifically, how do we determine whether or not a building falls under the requirements of section, sorry, subsection 3.2.6 of the Ontario Building Code? So, how do we determine uh, whether or not the vertical distance that defines the height of a building falls under the category of high? Well, um, let's start first of all with what the building code says about this under subsection 3.2.6. And what it does say is that basically you calculate the vertical distance of the height of a building from the average grade um, of the floor level outside, the outdoor average grade level, and it's average because you want to measure, you want to calculate if the, if the grade is different on two different levels, and it goes all the way to the top floor level. Now that might be a bit confusing. I can see how that might be confusing. So maybe let me try with something more graphical. How about this? Let's say we have this multi-story building. Uh, basically what the building code says under subsection 3.2.6 is that to determine if the building falls under the category, this part three building falls under the category of a high building, you have to calculate this vertical dimension. It's the vertical dimension that goes from average grade outside, so like right here, all the way to the top floor level. Notice how it didn't go all the way to the roof. It goes to the highest floor level. And that's because that's the highest that people are going to be occupying in a building. Right? People don't typically occupy the roof of a building. They occupy up to the highest floor level. So it's that vertical distance that's going to determine whether or not a building is high or not. So under uh, clause 3.2.6.11, um, we're going to see how the building code actually describes high buildings. So first of all, uh, under um, sentence 3.2.6.1a, you'll notice that the building code starts by distinguishing uh, amongst different occupancies. So under then uh, uh, sentence 3.2.6.1a, uh, the building code looks at buildings of A, D, E, and F occupancy only. And what this sentence says is that high building classifications apply if the height of the building is more than 36 meters measured from average grade to the top floor. Okay, If it's more than 36 meters, it's a high building. Or if and pardon me, I'm going to read this. Uh, eight, it, if that distance, if that vertical distance is more than 18 meters high, measured between grade and the floor level of the top story, and in which the cumulative or total occupant load on or above any story above grade, and whew, okay, that's that's painful to read, right? 
so I'm seeing something related to uh, 1.8 and 36 and 300. Basically, what this is, is a formula that's been written out in words. So this would have been a lot easier, us being in an engineering field, civil engineering field, if this had been written out as a formula. But don't worry, I'll show you exactly how to use this. So basically, what this sentence is saying, very simply put, is this. If you have a building that has an A, D, E, or F major occupancy, if it's more than 36 meters high, then it's a high building. Boom. If it's less than 18 meters in height, it's not a high building. Boom. It's only when it's between 18 meters and 36 meters in this vertical height, right? And remember how we calculated it? Average grade to top floor, not top ceiling, not top roof, top floor. And it's only if it's between 18 meters and 36 meters for A, D, E, and F occupancies that you have to use a formula. Okay, that formula that it was explained by all those words. And I'll show you exactly, exactly how to use it. Okay? We're going to do this by, we're going to learn it by doing. But first of all, I want to remind you that in your course notes, I sketched or I provided these sketches of typical buildings. Okay, that we're going to be using that apply to high buildings. So make sure you're comfortable with them because they will help you a whole bunch. Okay. All right. But first, let's get to an example. Let's learn how to identify high buildings by doing. Let's learn by doing. So what we have here is an example. I'm going to read it out for you. It's shown in your course notes, I believe, on page two. Uh, so let me just read it out loud for you to make sure we're talking about the same question. The following, and there's a, uh, a plan drawing beneath, is a typical floor plan of an eight-story office building. The typical floor to floor height is 3,600 millimeters, 3,600 millimeters. Average grade is 300 millimeters below the ground floor level. Assume the total exit width for each floor is the minimum required by code given that all stair risers are 185 millimeters in height. And what I'm seeing here in this floor plan, it's an office buildings, look like there are four large suites, two exit stairs. The floor plan measures 65 meters long by 30 meters high. And we're being told a few things that are important. First, oh yeah, I guess we have to figure out whether or not this uh, is a high building or not for the purposes of three point two point six of the Ontario Building Code. So let's do this. I want to highlight some of the important information that's present here. First, this is an eight-story office building. The floor to floor height, so that's basically the story height, okay, is three point six meters or three thousand six hundred millimeters. The average grade Again, not just grade on one side, the average grade is 300 millimeters or 0.3 meters below the ground floor level. And then you're told that the exit widths, I see two here, must meet the minimum requirements for exit widths in the code. And that is according to topic 12, right? Okay, let's, let's do this. Um, now, you should be familiar with how to figure out exit widths, right? Remember exit widths? We did it in topic 12. But if you're not, you want to go back and check this out. Because I'm not going to explain how to calculate exit widths, I'll just do it. Let's solve this. What do we need to do? Well, first of all, uh, how do we figure out if this is a high building? Well, uh, what do we have here? I guess the first thing we need to do is, given that we know that it's a D occupancy, it's an office, right? So that's a D occupancy. We have to calculate that vertical distance that 
allows us to figure out whether or not it's a high building. So that vertical distance, remember, goes from average grade to the top floor. In this case, we're not given that dimension. We have to calculate it based on the information given. And the only information that we were given was the story height, right, the floor to floor height, 3.6 meters, and average grade below ground level. So what we have to do is, based on that information, we have to do the floor to floor height, which is 3.6 meter, times seven stories. But wait a minute, aren't there eight stories here? Don't forget that we're not looking for the height to the roof, we're looking to the height to the highest floor, right? Anyways, so 3.6 times 7 meters, and then to that we're going to add the grade level, average grade level. So we get a distance of 25.5 meters. This distance is more than 18 and less than 36 meters. So that means that this may be a high building. We don't know yet. We actually have to apply the cumulative occupant load formula, right? That formula that was written out in words that I uh, ran out of breath when I tried to read it. So let's see if we can figure out what that formula actually looks like. You can do this and I'm going to show you how. That formula is basically a fraction where the numerator is the occupant load per floor multiplied by the total number of floors above grade minus 1. The denominator is 1.8 times the total width in meters of all exit stairs. So I'm just going to let you look at this for a moment. All those words translate into this fraction where again the numerator is the occupant load per each floor multiplied by the total number of floors minus 1. The denominator is 1.8 times the width in meters of all exit stairs. So how do we find the occupant load per floor? Go back to topic 2, topic 3, thereabouts, and you'll see you multiply the area, the plan area of that floor, and you divide that by the occupant load factor. In this case, because it's a D office occupancy, that load factor is 9.3 square meters per person. When you do this calculation, you get 210 persons because humans are whole numbers. Remember that? Now that's the total number of persons that are expected on any floor at any one time. But we need to calculate the width for each stair and therefore we need to figure out how many of those people are going to each stair. Based on the plan view on the previous slide we have two exits. So we take that number divided by two we get 105 people for each exit stair. If we had three exit stairs you divide by three. If it was four by four and then we have to calculate the exit width. And remember how it's based on two things, right? It was based on the number of people using that exit and the minimum requirements for one person to get through. So the number of people is measured by 9.2 millimeters per person and there's the reference for you to look up. So that tells us that the exit width based on the total number of people using that, the capacity, is 966 millimeters but the minimum required for a single human to get through is 1100 millimeters. Again, go back to topic 12 to see how I figured this out. So what is the minimum exit width? It's 1100 millimeters. And then we take all of these numbers and we put them into that fraction that I have at the very top of the slide. So we have the occupant load times the number of floors minus 1, so that's 210 people times 8 minus 1 gives us 7 and then all of that gets divided by 1.8 times the width in meters of each stair so that's 1.10 meters times two stairs because there are two stairs in this case this is a very common mistake okay people who start out with this formula commonly will forget to multiply that minimum exit that was calculated by 
the total number of stairs on that floor plan. Okay? When you do that calculation, you get that the number is 371.2. That number being greater than the 300 in the building code tells us that this is in fact a high building. Okay? So this occupancy, a deoccupancy, its height is greater than 18 meters and because it satisfied these requirements, so it's greater than 300 this fraction, it is considered a high building. So why do we even care? Right? I mean, according to 3.2.6 of the Ontario Building Code, Part 3, why do we even care if this applies? Why do we care if a building is considered high according to Part 3 of the Building Code? Well, here's the thing. The requirements of buildings that fall under the high category typically result in a high cost in the development or, say, a retrofit or renovation of that building. Okay? And that's not a bad thing. It simply means that once a building is identified as high, there's a higher level of care that's expected to be put into that building to ensure it's safe for all the occupants. Because you can see how as you get a higher and higher building, there are more things you have to do to it to ensure people, especially the ones higher up, can get out safely. Right? So sometimes, it can be helpful to make changes to, say, a building floor plan or plans in general to avoid this high building classification while still being safe and while still taking care of the occupants for that building. Let me give you some examples. Let's say that we're looking at the example we just did, right? That's that uh, floor plan, that office floor plan. Let's say as one alternative, we decided to add, instead of only having two exit stairs, we add a third one, so that we have three exit stairs. Then, in the denominator of that fraction, that two would become a three, like you see here. And suddenly, by adding an extra, an additional exit stair in the whole building, on all levels, notice how the number falls to below 300. Try calculating it yourself to confirm that I get the right number. Suddenly, by getting that this building is less than th it gives you a value less than 300, it is no longer a high building. Another example is, what if you keep the number of stairs, of exit stairs, but you make them wider? Okay, so that will change this value in your fraction and the result is that you get a number that's less than 300 and this too will avoid that high building cl classification. And again, you're simply looking at other ways to keep your building safe and avoid that high building classification. But I mean, sometimes you can't and that's okay. So then, then Let's extrapolate this and move on from just the four occupancies we were just looking at, right? Because we looked at, um, uh, what were the A, D, E, and F occupancies. But what about all the other occupancies? Well, according to 3.2.6.11b and D, uh, this subsection, that is, a building is called high for B and C occupancies when the highest story of that occupancy is more than 18 meters above grade. So there is no black and white, right? There is no more than 36, less than 36, or in between with the fraction. As long as the topmost story is more than 18 meters above grade, boom high building according to this. Even more specifically, according to the building code, under 3.2.6.11c, if you have a floor area or part of a floor area located above the third story that is intended as a B2 or B3 occupancy, 
Okay, so that means if you have a B2 or B3 occupancy above the third story, then that whole building is considered a high building right away. Okay. Now, I want to show you some of the requirements that come with having your building classified as a high building. And these are purely for your information only. Okay, I'm not going to test you on this, but you should be aware of. So look at this, okay? There are suddenly items related to the limiting of smoke movements, uh, elevator operations, how elevators may be used by firefighters, alarm systems, control facilities, voice communication systems. Okay? So these are requirements to make your building safer because it's getting taller. Great. Uh, that's it really for this topic. I would like you to get started with homework eight, uh, sorry, homework nine now. You will get this topic by practicing it. It's not difficult, but as you saw, you require a little bit of help with some of the ways that things are written in the building code. So I'm hoping that homework nine is going to work out for you. That's it. That's it, really. I want to thank you so much for your time. You could have chosen to spend your time doing anything else, but you're doing this. Thank you so much. Please. Don't forget, if you haven't already, download the course notes to your device of choice. Don't just rely on viewing them on Brightspace. Okay? Thank you so, for, so much for your time. I appreciate it and have a good day.